Well, Community Heights, it's go time. I said it last week, I'll say it this week, and this week as we're beginning a new five-week series, I told you a couple weeks ago I didn't really have a title for it, I didn't have a name for it, so I just made one up, and so the name of the series is It's Go Time, because it's time for us to go. I mean, who wants to be in the new year? By the way, Happy New Year, it's 2019. You write not your checks. You know who writes checks anymore, right? But you know, you got 20. And uh, I'm still writing 19 something sometimes. So it's the new year. Who wants to be not as good this year as you were last year? Who wants to have less this year than you had last year? Who wants to do less than we did last year? Who wants to achieve less, make less of an impact? than we achieved last year or than an impact we made last year. None of us really wants to. We all want to move forward. And so let this series and let these five weeks and what we do together be the, uh, uh, be the, the, the spiral bound where the page turns and it's time to go. It's time to create something new and different out of our lives together here at Community Heights for the purpose of glorifying God by growing together and reaching out and inviting other people into the family of believers, bringing other people into the kingdom. So for this morning, the theme is, it's go time, and I've got three questions to ask you. The first question is, and these are the three questions that every church has to ask. And the first one is this, why do we exist? It's the question of mission. Why why are we here? Why Community Heights? Why this church? You know, we tend to identify ourselves with a building, with a room, with a culture. But as a people, if the building were to, to, uh, if in the dead of night when nobody was here, Uh, a tornado, uh, and what do they call them, a something five, whatever the five tornado is, hit this building, just dropped down and whoop, wiped us off the hill and then went back up into the heavens. What would we be? Who would we be as a church? Who would we be as a group of believers? How would that impact us? How would that affect us? So why do we exist? What is our mission? What's our mission? It's amazing how many people don't really know why they do what they do. They don't know why they react the way they react, and they don't really even know why they believe what they believe. They just say, well, I just do that. It's just what I do. Or I I just, just the way I reacted. I can't help it. Or I mean, that's just what I believe. I, I don't know why I believe it. It's just what I believe, what I've always believed. It's good, it's good to know why we do what we do. I told you maybe last week or the week before, that's a question, oh, that's the question that gets to me. Well, what do you want to have happen as a result of, of that activity? Uh, I don't know. We just always do it, right? Churches say that all the time. Well, why are you doing this ministry? Why do you do it this way? What, you know, what about this? What outcome do you want here? We generally don't know. So why do we exist as a question of mission? And that's the question we're going to address today. But there's two other questions. The second one is, where are we going? And that's the question of vision. It's not often that somebody gets in a car and puts it into gear and starts rolling and doesn't really know where they're going. Now, once in a while, maybe, but I remember as a a youngster, I say youngster, as a young adult, me and my buddy Ken would get in his souped up, jacked up duster with the gold stripes on the back of it, and we would, uh, we would you know, just kind of cruise around town, and, you know, where were we going? We weren't really going anywhere. We were just, you know, driving. I knew that eventually that night I'd end up right back home, but usually when you get in a car, you're going from point A to point B. And this idea of vision is the question of, you know, where are we going as a church? Well, we're, 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 we're immobile, right? We're, we're right here. We're fixed. We're, we're built here on the, but that's, that's assuming that the church is the building or the facility or the property or the address. But in reality, 160 something hours out of the week, we're all out and about. We're going somewhere. We're doing something. 
So where are we going as a church? That's the question that we want to answer over the next four weeks. What is our vision as a church over, let's say, the next five years? And then the third question is, how are we going to get there? How will we get there? And that's the question of strategy. That's the question that almost no church ever really fully answers and and, uh, uh, engages in. How are we going to get there? Well, most churches kind of know their mission, kind of, and they're real fuzzy on their vision. They really have very little idea about strategy. Why? Because as organizations go, and a church is an organization, it's an organism of people, as organizations go, things tend toward complexity, things tend to as the baton gets handed from one leader to the next to the next, the reason why we ever started that thing way back there gets really fuzzy. And so the reason why we're keeping it going is just because it's been going. So we're just doing it because it's what we've always done. And that's literally true in businesses, in churches, in organizations, in clubs, and companies. People begin to do things now in a lot of places, there's, there's, uh, there are consequences for doing things just to do them. Amazingly, in a local church, there can often be consequences that are very minor that happen over time that people don't pay attention to so they don't really drive correction or focus or clarity. So like I said again some months ago, that over the last, uh, this is uh, 2003, 2009, 15, 16 years now, the consequence, just little, little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit, are, are the, the footprint of the number of people that are around here on the weekend has been going down. And this is the year to not get in the way of it going in a different direction. This is the year for us to not get in the way of God working through his body both in the body and in the community. And so that question, how will we get there, is the question of strategy. And here's, what I, here's my challenge for you. Small groups, official small groups and unofficial small groups. If you go on our website, you'll see one of the tabs at the top says um, go time. If you click on that tab for this week, week one, there's a short video and there's a discussion guide. You can do it with your spouse. As a couple, you can get another couple together. As friends or people maybe that you don't know real well, you want to get together and get to know each other a little better. You could do it in twos, threes. You could do it in tens. You could do it in a group of 20. You could do it in your current small group. But I'm asking you to do it between now and next Sunday. Get together. Look at the video. Part of it is me. Part of it toward the end is the president of our denomination something that uh, I think is really important that fits right into what we're talking about today. And then there's a discussion guide. And in that discussion guide, this is real important because this is philosophical and theological for our church. In the discussion guide, it says, before you start, assign someone to be the note taker who's gonna write down the ideas or the answers or the opinions of the people in the group And then before you disband, send those notes to me. And then I am going to send them to the rest of our staff and to our elders. Because the Holy Spirit works in all of us. So as you're getting together in groups, and you're praying together, and the Holy Spirit is working through you and through your gifting, he is going to speak to our body through all of us. And this is especially true when it comes to this strategy piece. Like, we know our mission, and, and about a couple dozen of us have spent a lot of time working on our vision for the future, but the strategy of how we're going to get it done is dependent, it's dependent on all of us, and that's one of the core values of the Alliance, is that completing the Great Commission requires the involvement and the investment of every fully devoted follower of Jesus. None of us is an appendix in the body of Christ. None of us is. So, in that discussion guide, I have my email address, but I also have my cell phone number right on that discussion guide. So just write down your notes, take a picture of the notes, and then just message it to me. Just text it to me. 
If you have one of those special, like I have, one of those special scanner PDF creator apps, you can even create a PDF out of it and send me a PDF. Everything that you send me is gonna get seen by all of the pastors and staff and by all of the elders. The body works together to do the work of the ministry. That's how it's gonna happen. We, it, can't be, it can't be a staff led or even just a leadership driven, executed ministry. All of us are important, so do that. Give us feedback, give us input, and give us ideas, and together we're gonna accomplish this vision. So today, the question is, what is our mission? Why do we exist? Well, before we go there, I need five volunteers. Now, in the first service, there's a lot less of you that are in this service. Man, I had five volunteers up here. I was shocked in that first service. We think there's a lot of the older folks from the first service. They were right up here. I just need five volunteers. You don't have to sing. You don't have to speak. You're not going to be embarrassed. I won't make you eat anything because I've done that before. Chop, chop. Let's go. First five. Okay, one. Hey, you're the hero. Let's see. Steve, okay, we got, what? Let's see. Come on, Darren. Come on, Darren. Oh, here we go. Oh, yes. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, cool. We've got six. We can get creative. I have six. Here, you pass out the pens, okay? Don't look at what's written on the other side because that's from the first service. Oh, wait a minute. How many do we have up here? We have six? There's one for you, one for you, one for you, and one for you. That's for you. You got to write on that. Okay. So now what you're going to write down, and don't let each other see what the other one says. You're going to, in one sentence... In one sentence, I want you to write down the answer to this. What is the mission of our church? Why do we exist here in the community of Newton? Why does our church exist here in Newton? In one sentence. Okay, well, you guys are writing. Don't listen. Hey, on this side, what do you think? What's one of the things they're going to say? Serve others. Okay, serve others. Okay, that could be one of them. What else? Make disciples to know Jesus and make him known. Good Christian Missionary Alliance phrase there. Support missions, okay. Glorify God. Boilerplate, standard right there. That's good, theologically sound, biblically correct. What else? What's that? Be a living sacrifice, okay. What else, anything else? Anything from Acts 1-8, good, good. Be witnesses. Share the gospel, okay, good. All right, are we done? We're still going? Okay, so let's see this, let's see that. Okay, there's that. You didn't make a complete sentence? Oh, that's not your gift? Oh, you saved yourself there. I was just gonna tell everybody. Do not get your dental work done for the guy who can't make a complete sentence. <laughs> but that's not your gift, so. He's done a lot of dental work over on this side of my mouth, so he's okay. You guys, you are now dismissed. You're dismissed. See, you didn't have to eat anything bad. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to mix these up. And we're not going to know. I don't even know. Well, except for the... <laughs> There's going to be one that's not a complete sentence. <laughs> what is the mission of our church? Boy, this one, this person even wrote down the question first. To teach us and lead us to God, remind us we need Jesus to be saved. Okay, teach us, lead us to God, remind us we need Jesus to be saved. This one says, learn, oh, I love this one. Learn to love enemies. Love God with all your heart. I think that's the best one. <laughs> love God, love others, make disciples. That's good. To know God and make him known. Now that was, was that up here? Right, for years and years? 
mission to share Christ with those who God places in our path. To serve others and worship God. Wow, those are good answers, aren't they? Good answers. Now, yes. Boy, the greatest kind of love is the kind of love where you would even love your enemies. Learn to love enemies. Oh. I mean, not that the other ones aren't good. <laughs> that one, I don't know. I almost want to frame that one because that's, that's hard. That's hard. That's like, that's the hardest thing to do is to learn to love our enemies. So, why do we exist? Here's what we came up with. As a group of a couple dozen, we came up with this. Love God with all our heart, love our neighbor as ourself, and make disciples of all nations. That comes straight out of Matthew 22 and Matthew 28, the great commandment and the great commission. If we were to shorten it just a little bit, we exist basically to love and to make disciples. And I think that about everything in there is gonna fit into loving and making disciples. Creating more followers of Jesus Christ. Being a follower and creating more followers. So let's look at some scripture here. In Deuteronomy chapter six, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the love part because we spent a lot of time on that. But back in Deuteronomy chapter six, one of the great passages of scripture that all Jewish people and Hebrew people would understand and also believers in Christ, Christians, is this one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. This love commandment is the one that Jesus quoted. When they asked him in the New Testament, they said, uh, what is the greatest commandment in the law? So in the five books of Moses, what's the greatest commandment? Because there's a lot of them there. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. It's the first and greatest, is to love God. That's our mission as a church. Our mission as a church is to love God. And then secondly, Jesus said, the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. So this first command to love is the greatest commandment, the commandment to love. That's our mission. That's why we're here. The church, Community Heights Alliance Church, this church exists in Newton to love God and love our community and to love each other. Of course, that's always helpful, right? That we love each other and that we love our community as we love God. I'll show you this slide, my favorite slide, of course. This one's my favorite. You remember it from 16 months ago. Love was the basis and the bottom, the foundation, the fundamental motivator and fuel for all of our life. Without love, Paul said, nothing works. Without love, love it's all done in vain. Without love, it doesn't really matter. And love, in fact, points people to Jesus. Love is the foundational motivation. And then making, the, making disciples above that, it's all of the action is making disciples as we connect in relationships, as we serve with the gifts God has given us, as we live lives of worship individually and corporately together before our community. Then God grows us and he uses us to reach out into the lives of other people all in this process of continually maturing, continually maturing, always growing, becoming more like Jesus Christ. Now, in terms of discipleship, making disciples, disciple isn't really a word we use in our culture anymore. The word is follower. Some organizations use the term adherent. You know, you, you stick to it, adhere. You're an adherent of the teachings or, uh, or the beliefs or the mission of an organization. But we're followers of Jesus Christ. We're students. He's our teacher. He's our Lord. He's our master. So in Matthew 28, we get to the end of the book of Matthew, and this is the Great Commission. Then the 11 disciples, 
the followers of Jesus, they went north up to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Now, this is like the Great Commission. This is like the, the, the major text of the New Testament. And in this, there's this little phrase drop, but some doubted. And then he just goes right on. Like, why? Why did God the Holy Spirit guide Matthew to write, but some doubted? Right before he's about to say, go into all the world and make the disciples. Maybe because sometimes we doubt. And he's saying, it's okay. Even the original disciples who followed Jesus for two to three years, who saw the miracles, who talked to the people who were healed, who experienced the regenerative work of the cross and the resurrection, and who walked with the risen Christ, even they doubted. You think we're going to doubt once in a while? Yeah, we're going to have doubts. It makes us human, just like the disciples. But, verse 18 says, Then Jesus came to them, even in their doubt, for some of them, and he said, You guys, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's a big deal. All authority, not just here on earth, but in heaven. All authority is mine. I have all authority. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. The word there is ethnics. Of all people groups. All kinds of people on earth. Go and make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. That's a big deal. Obey everything you have commanded? That's the expectation. That's a big expectation. But that's the expectation that God has for us. That we as the body of Christ would go. And we would teach people how to follow Jesus, and how to obey all of his commandments. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I love what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1. He's speaking to the believers in the city of Colossae, and he says, you know, we're just kind of dropping into the context here in verse 27. To them, to the people of God, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. Paul talked about this mystery that was revealed to him as an apostle, as Jesus personally, the resurrected Christ, taught him and guided him. He shared this mystery, and the mystery was that after all these years of God being the God of the Jews, The offer was opened up to the Gentiles, to all people. And the glorious riches of this mystery was this, Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus in you. This morning we had uh, uh, a young boy who comes on Wednesday nights. He came this morning with his mom. His mom was here for the first time. And uh, she grew up in a different church, And she was found to be with child, this boy. But she wasn't married. Um, And they invited her out. And she hasn't been a part of a church for the past 13 years. And so we got to talk together. and, And her son said to me, Mom wants you to show me the Romans road in here. And he had his Bible opened up to Romans, turned my direction, and he was holding it. So we went back in my office after the first service and I took my pen and I went through and I underlined. He already had a couple of those verses underlined and I underlined and I numbered them. The Romans road from the, 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 basically the gospel out of the book of Romans from chapter one through chapter uh, 10. Um, One of the things I told them, we talked about the triune God. Now I had to be really careful because I get all theological, but this stuff is important because it's real. So I told him, you know how you have a tricycle? A tricycle has three wheels. A bicycle has two wheels. We have a triune God. He's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And the Father is in heaven over all of creation. 
And the Bible says that the Son is seated at the right hand of the Father, but the Holy Spirit is in each one of us. And so when one of us gets wounded, we all have the same spirit, we all believe in the same Savior, we come alongside each other and we help each other. We don't kick one another out. And you have the same Holy Spirit that I have, and that connects us together. We, we, had, we had a great conversation, but that's what this is saying in here. here. Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the good news of the gospel, is that God wants to indwell people. He didn't just come down and become human and dwell among us, walk among us, but in the, through his spirit, he indwells us. He's resident inside of us. And, and Paul says in verse 28, he is the one we proclaim, Jesus. He's the one we proclaim, not ourselves. We admonish and teach everyone with all wisdom so that, here it is, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. Now let me ask you, are you fully mature in Christ? Do you consider yourself fully mature in Christ? You'd probably say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> not, com- not completely, I mean, I mean, that's, you know, I don't want to be presumptuous or proud or anything, but what if it really wasn't that complicated? And what if it really wasn't that, like, out of reach to be fully mature in Christ? Because Paul is saying there, what if it wasn't that unattainable? Paul is saying he wants to present, he says, everyone fully mature in Christ. How could you do that, Paul? Do you know all the discipleship lessons you'd have to take them through? All the gold stars and check marks they'd have to go through and the badges and stuff like that? Because the 20th century church taught us that fully mature in Christ meant deep, deep discipleship, and dogged learning of the scriptures and verse memorization and systematic theological study. But what if it really isn't that crazy? So, We exist to love God with all our hearts, love our neighbor as ourselves, and make disciples of all nations. What if making disciples involved teaching people who they are in Christ? That they are righteous and blameless. In fact, uh, I marked a verse here in that same book in Colossians chapter 1, verse 22. Listen to what this says. Paul says, but now he has reconciled you Remember last week, the ministry and the message of reconciliation? Now he has reconciled you, brought you back together by Christ's physical body through death to present you three things, holy in his sight, without blemish, and free from accusation. So if you would stand before God right now, holy in God's eyes, without any blemish, and free from accusation, do you think that would qualify as being fully mature in Christ? Because remember what Paul says. Paul said, so that we may present everyone fully mature, but then he added, in Christ. Because in Christ, we have become the righteousness of God. In Christ, we are forgiven. We are holy. We are blameless. We are lovely. We are clean. We're a new creation. We're his child. And maybe when followers of Jesus really understand and embrace who they are in Christ, they'll be like, yeah, those cartoons, followers of Jesus, be like, I am righteous. I guess I am holy. I mean, I don't feel holy most of the time, but I guess I am blameless. I guess I am free from accusation. I can live into that. I can, I can live from that as the starting point. Now I can live for Jesus because I am fully mature in Christ. Because Christ, when he creates a new creation out of us, he doesn't leave any stone unturned. He fixes it all. A completely new creation. So if you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have to believe who God says you are. That you're a child of God. You're not a lowly, wormy sinner anymore. You're a saint 
who still sins because you're in the flesh. But sin shall no longer have dominion over you. Sin has no, you're not hostage and in bondage to sin anymore. Are you going to sin? Yeah, you're going to sin. Is it taken care of? It's taken care of. Shall we sin because it's taken care of? Paul says, God forbid. Shall we live as though we were still under the penalty and, and bondage and a hostage to sin? God forbid. So as we talk about making disciples, we have to teach ourselves first who we are in Christ and then invite others to come in and join the party and be part of this kingdom where you get cleaned up by God and you don't have to do it yourself. God sets you free and God makes you clean. That's part of becoming a disciple. So in short, we exist to love and to make disciples. Now, it's a beautiful thing when a church family understands its mission. And no matter who you ask in the church, they would say, yep, this is our mission. This is, where we're, this is why we exist. This is why we're here. This is our mission. So there was this college girl running indoor track, running a 600-meter race. This is, you might have seen this before. This has, been, this has been 10 years ago. But she's running the 600-meter race indoors, which is three laps around. And she's just about to take the lead after the second lap, and she falls flat on her face. But she understood her mission. This girl knew that her mission was to finish the race in first place. That was her mission. So take a look at this. Watch this. And we have some things that we can learn from it. Minnesota finished second in this match a year ago. She was in lane four. And Dornan is probably going to be your favorite. She actually won the NCAA championships in 2006 in the 800, but she only won one Big Ten championship in the two years. Three laps in this event, 600 meters, three times around the 200 meter track here at the field house. What a bold move by Fallon. She's looking very confident, and the Penn State runner is just running amazing today. She did win her heat in the 400, but ended up taking fourth overall. That's Fawn Dorr moving into the lead, a sophomore from Penn State. Dornan running second. Dornan last year scored 23 points for the Golden Gophers in their Big Ten Championship, so they're really relying on getting a lot of points from her this weekend, and she's... Just coming by Fondor now in the home stretch, heading into the bell lap. Oh, 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 oh. Down. Gordon falling down gets up quickly, but that's going to cost her. Lucky she wasn't injured. Her teammate just went to the front, though, so they may be able to recover from that. And Dornan is flying down the back she stretch. Is she catching is up. She is going to catch Fondor, and she may catch the leader. Wow. But wow. she's got fun. This is a gutsy effort by Dornan. Can't you pull it off? She's moving. That is amazing. To, to fall in a 600, I mean, this is basically a sprint. I mean, this is an extended 400, basically. To, to fall with 200 meters to go and get up and win, that is unbelievable. Unbelievable. That's one of the most exciting wow. I've ever seen. Here's the fall. Oh, she trips on Fawn's shoe. It looked like Fawn just clipped her heel, and she went down just before the bell lap. Fawn Dora had to fight her here to avoid a collision. And she is powering down this home stretch, just doing everything she can to win this heat. What you see is right here on her face, she's got a big gash and a cut here, and she's just bleeding. She said that in that last 50 meters, she found a gear, she hit a gear, how'd she say it? I hit a gear that I never knew I had. I mean, when you come in one lap 
that far back, after that jolting, you know, you hit the ground. But she knew what her mission was. She had one job to do. The job was to get around three times before the other three girls got around. And she did it and she completed it. So Community Heights Church, in the next five years, I think that we are going to find out that we're going to hit a gear that we've never hit before. Because it's not our gear, it's Jesus' gear. It's Christ's gear. It's God's gear. I like what Paul said, in, or what, what, what Jesus said in John chapter 15. He said, abide in me as I also abide in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must abide in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. See, we're not, we don't do it on our own. The only thing we have to do is to stay out of the way of Jesus building his church and using his body, his body to do what he already wants to accomplish in the community of Newton. There are already people here in whose lives he's working. We had one couple, we had two young people here this morning, a young single mom with her young son. God is working in their lives. He's working in this boy's life. You know what this boy needs? And this is what they asked. They said, is there any big brother, big sister type of a thing around here? Because the last place we lived, my son had a big tiger, little tiger program. And he really liked that. They said, we went to the Y. We don't think that they have it there. And, and that would be really helpful. And it, and it, and it just... It gave me up and down my spine because as we go in the next four weeks, these are the things we're talking about as a church. We have to meet the practical needs of people in our community. And there were two people just here this morning. And every week there are people that show up to Community Heights Church with needs in their life. So this this idea that we exist to love God and to make disciples And we also exist so that when you come in, you're loved by God and you're cared for by other people and that God is using his body to reach out to you when you come in here as somebody from the community who's normally not a part of our church. So these are the things we're going to be talking about. Um, And sometimes we're going to fall flat in our face. We are. So just, I'm just telling you ahead of time. We are going to fall flat on our face. We're going to be like, yeah, church flat on its face be like, what's up? Not us. What are we going to do? Okay, well, when we get there, God is going to be there. And as I think it was John Maxwell who said, when you fall down and you're on the ground, pick something up while you're down there. Because there's stuff down there on the ground. Just pick something up so that when you get up, it's not a wasted fall. So... I want to invite Micah Aran to come up. Micah, would you come up? I, I want to just debrief a little bit here on mission because mission is so important and we have to be clear on our mission, okay? Clear on our mission. So Micah, take the seat here. I'm going to get my top secret, super secret interview notes. Micah, you told me in the first service you've been coming here since what year was it? Um, it's been almost four years, I think, around okay. four years. Almost four years, and you've been for the last 18 months somewhere. Tell us where you've been. I've been in Peon, Haiti with Many Hands for Haiti, a missions organization based out of Pella, Iowa. How did you con- get connected to Many Hands? Um, actually, I was working at Bridge House. A friend of a friend went to work for Many Hands himself, came back and said, hey, I know that you're passionate about missions. This is a great place. Why don't you check them out? Cool. So what is the mission of Many Hands? Do they have like a mission statement? They do. It is transforming together to be love in action in a broken world. Oh, I like that. Say it one more time. Transforming together to be love in action in a broken world. Okay, so there's what? Three parts to that. Transforming together. And the key word in that would be transforming 
and together, <laughs> all right? Because life is done in community, right? So the expectation there is that together we're going to change and grow and be transformed. So the next part of it is? To be love in action. Ooh, that's a good one. To be love in action. So honestly, is there true love without action? No, right? Love isn't a static thing. It's a dynamic thing. So, okay, so transforming together, we're going to change together by being love in action. And then the last part. In a broken world. In a broken world. Defines the context that it's going to happen in. So it could be difficult then. It's very difficult. Everyone's broken. You can't get away from it. But in the brokenness, we're supposed to transform together by being love in action. Absolutely. Everything that we do, the team down in Haiti, we always ask ourselves, does this bring life transformation in Christ? So can you give me an illustration, an example of how you've seen this mission played out or lived out in your ministry? Absolutely. Um, there is a woman named Louisa, and I met Louisa on my very first mission trip to Haiti. She is a Christian woman with a husband who is a voodoo witch doctor, and she's raising her orphaned grandson. Um, her grandson's name is Jerry. He, while well, he's never small per se, he was always just behind developmentally and generally sick. Uh, Louisa was in a very hard position with her home life. Her husband did not support her decision to follow Jesus. And with, as she's been coming to visit us on our campus, we've had the ability to just do life with her and disciple her and her little grandson. And now it's been two or three years later, her grandson is thriving and healthy. He's in preschool. He's still a little shy, but he has the cutest giggle. And Louisa is in a better place with her home life. Um, God has provided her a safe place to be. And in every aspect of her life, she, gets God, she gives God glory because of how far that he has brought her, how he's always looked after her, and how he um, has worked in her grandson's life. So as you've been watching Louisa, getting to know her, watching her life, how has that impacted you as a believer? It just reminds me that no matter where I am, no matter how dark the circumstances seem to be, God always has the way, and he won't ever leave us. Okay, so you talk about dark circumstances. Um, how is life for a Haitian believer different than like for us here? So we're all a fairly homogenous group, we're a lot the same, and in Haiti is very different. You're a minority in Haiti. How do they experience faith in Christ differently than we do? You know, I think in many ways we're the same. Humanity is much the same everywhere. It's just different cultures tend to cling to different things, right? And in Haiti, because they don't have necessarily the resources we have to hide behind, life just seems so much more raw. That being said, I've really noticed in the Haitian church that they cling to the fear of the Lord and that is their driving and guiding stick. Whereas I've noticed in the American church, we understand and we reach out towards the grace of God. They're both very real aspects of God. It's just our cultures tend to um, display certain aspects a little bit more than the other. So how was it for you coming back home after being there, you know, for months and months and months? What, um, what was the re-engagement rub that you felt when you came back? You know, that you were like, oh, I'm not used to this. I've got to get back into my, I'm back home mode. Something that you just weren't used to because you'd been away for so long. Well, first off, going to the grocery store takes me a lot longer than it does in Haiti. Oh, really? Why is that? Um, there's so many overwhelming choices. Whereas in Haiti, 
there is what there is and you make do with what you have and if you don't have it then you have to trust God for it so you were paralyzed with indecision I spent way too many minutes trying to figure out which crackers I was going to buy okay interesting interesting so what do you do when you're there what is your responsibility in that ministry we have a number of programs there on the ground so my main role is to gather the stories and the data from the programs and then share that with the people back in the US one of my favorite roles is sharing the stories so I get to meet people like Louisa and when I share her story um, there's two aspects to it one I get to encourage the people back here in the US with the stories of Christians in other places but also I get to encourage Louisa because then she knows that her story is significant not only does God see her but there's a whole church around the globe who wants to hear about her story and can be encouraged because of her faith and because of her everyday life. What is the importance of the mission for many hands? Like if you didn't have that mission statement, you know, that probably wouldn't be good. But how, how important is that mission statement to what you're doing? The mission statement reminds us of what we're doing day in day out you see the good things you see the really hard things and sometimes you just get encouraged or you get discouraged it's the mission statement that you can work together to be reminded that there's a real purpose to being here god didn't just throw you out there to flounder he puts you there for a reason so uh when are you going back january 16th it's in about a week and a half okay a week and a half and are you, do you have enough support for the next however long you're going to be there? A year? Yeah. Um, I will be there for at least another year. Okay. As far as support, I'm at 86% of the funds raised. So that equals out to just a little bit under 3000 that I need left for this year. Okay. So you need a little under 3000 left. So the cool thing about Alliance Churches is we give toward missions and to opportunities like this just by designating our giving. So if you want to designate some of your giving to uh, Micah, you can just put uh, on, it, on it Haiti, just put Haiti on your envelope on your giving, and we'll make sure that, that all that goes to her support over the next year. But I think it's awesome that we have somebody like you, Micah, to, to come back and spend time with us and kind of educate us a little bit on on uh, what's going on in other countries and how other people are experiencing faith in Christ. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, thank you for the opportunity we have uh, to hear from Micah and to, uh, Lord, to be able to support what she's doing there in Haiti. We praise you, Lord, for the 86% that has uh, been committed already. And I pray that you would provide the remainder for her. And God, more than that, I pray that you would use her to make a difference in the lives of the Haitian people and to make a difference in the, on the team uh, of many hands. And we thank you that we could be a part of that. Lord, as we try to go out on mission to love and to make disciples, to make disciples and to love, Lord, help us to see that as, as not some super spiritual, super special thing that we have to do, but it's just a part of our lives. It's a part of being a follower of Jesus. We love you, we love others, and we lead people to know you, to have freedom and purpose and eternal life. So thank you, Lord, for this time, and I pray for our groups and for those that will get into groups, God, that the discussion time and the prayer time would be very significant and meaningful and that, Holy Spirit, you would speak through your body to give direction and to involve the whole body in the ministry of the church. In Jesus' name, amen.